This episode is presented by Avalair Ah. Hi, this is Waylon Chan, CFO of Grafana Labs. You're listening to the CFO Thought Leader Podcast. This is episode 911. And you can think of Turo as the Airbnb for cars. You know, in the United States, the average car sits idle 95% of the time. We have built this marketplace now to operate in five countries. We're, we're, co- we're in every state in the union. Uh, and as I said, we did we probably did about 150 million of revenue in 2020. And we ultimately ended up tripling the business in 2021. Uh, ended the year with $469 million of revenue, 213% growth. Because people were traveling and they were traveling domestically. They, were, they weren't they were going overseas, they were staying in the US and they wanted to get out of the house. And this was the same time that the traditional rental car companies had all defleeted during COVID to try to stay alive. Hi, it's Jack. On today's episode, we speak with Chuck Fisher, CFO of Turo. It was a meeting that Chuck Fisher tells us began not unlike hundreds, if not thousands of other meetings that he has sat in on during his 25-year business career. However, it was at one particular gathering of charter communication executives that Fisher says he witnessed firsthand the thinking that triggered one of the last decade's greatest strategic bets. Later that day, or perhaps a day or two later, the charter team began to contemplate the acquisition of Time Warner Cable, a company roughly four times charter size. Just what was said at that meeting and who said it put in motion the historic deal. You'll hear that story and much more on today's episode. We'll begin after this. This episode is presented by Avalair Ah. That's the sound of not worrying about sales tax compliance. Because when you automate it with Avalara, you don't have to worry about collecting sales tax or tracking who and what is tax exempt. With Avalara, you don't even have to worry about new tax laws and regulations. Avalara does it for you. If your business sells internationally, Avalara has you covered with cross-border tax compliance solutions. And when it comes time to file tax returns, Avalara automatically takes care of that too, giving you one less thing to worry about. Avalara has managed billions of sales for small, mid-size, and enterprise businesses and seamlessly works with your current sales, e-commerce, and accounting platforms. Take the worry out of tax compliance with Avalara. Ah. Learn more at avalara.com. That's A-V-A-L-A-R-A dot com. Saying hello, we're speaking with Chuck Fisher, CFO of Turo. Chuck, welcome. Uh, Thanks very much for having me. Looking forward to the conversation. So we always begin by looking back with our guest, asking them if they could take a a look at the experiences they feel prepared them for the role, try to recall some for us. Which ones come to mind? Yeah, you know, I think back on my career as a finance professional in kind of three chapters, all of which have played a a part in leading me to where I am today. In fact, the the third chapter is is my time here at Turo. But I go back to my start in investment banking. Um, I joined Lehman Brothers in 2000, right at about the time that the dot-com bubble was bursting and joined the, the, uh, the communications and media group. Um, and it was uh, an exciting time to be in the finance industry. And I think that starting and spending, which I did about 12 years uh, in investment banking, is a fantastic foundation for any professional, um, and certainly for a finance professional, obviously, given the, the focus of the work. But it, it teaches you a lot of things that you can take with you um, as you move through your career. It teaches you certainly about the value of hard work. Um, there's no question that the, the discipline and the work ethic that's required to be successful in investment banking um, is maybe unparalleled. And that kind of discipline and being surrounded by an environment of people that are all uh, very smart, very hardworking, very ambitious, um, and and operating in a truly meritocratic environment. 
you know, this is that's a it's kind of place where um, it, your ability to succeed is is really just down to to you and and how hard you work and and how well you do it at your at your craft. So I, I think that training and that foundation of working hard uh, in a meritocratic environment where you see every day, you know, how well you're doing um, puts you in a very, uh, you, you know, it, it teaches you a lot of things that you can that you can carry with you throughout your career. It also taught me about the value of teamwork um, it is as hard uh, an environment. It is it, it is very much a team sport. And you win together and you lose together. And it is, um, it, you know, it, it, it forms, um, you know, a, a, a set of habits about how you work with others um, and how you support others uh, in hard times and good times um, that I think was very formative for me. And then the final thing that I learned, I think, that was very important in investment banking was the power of, of building relationships. A lot of people come into banking. And they think that the way to be successful is to find the deals, just to follow the deal flow and be be where the action is. And somebody very early on in my career said, don't don't try to chase the deals. Find somebody who's going to take an interest in you in your career and attach yourself to that person. Make sure you find a mentor, somebody who's going to shepherd you through the the you know, the 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 uh, the vagaries of of the politics of an investment bank. And and that will that will serve you well. That that kind of relationship uh, will serve you well as you as you make your way along. And I found somebody very early on in my career uh, who has has played a, an active role uh, in all of my chapters. Uh, and and it's been it's been great to have um, a mentor, a friend, a sponsor. Um, in that case, it was a guy named Glenn Schiffman who was a, a boss of mine at, at Lehman uh, all through my time there. Uh, he became uh, actually somebody that I worked with in a in a different capacity in my next chapter when I moved to Charter Communications, and he was the guy who who helped me find my way into the current role at Turo as a CFO. My second sort of chapter, I guess, was at Charter Communications when I moved uh, from the banking side to the client side, and that was about learning how to take corporate finance and think about it in an operational context. What does it mean to be a finance professional at a company where the decisions that you're making influence and impact what happens every day? Um, and, you know, you go as all my time as a banker, I thought, you know, all these things that I'm doing, these bond deals, these IPOs, these M&A transactions felt very stressful. It really felt like I was, you know, sweating the details, living moment to moment. I was never more uh, I never felt more pressure than when I did my first transaction actually at the company. And I was doing, a, I remember I did my first bond deal at Charter. I, I joined as uh, uh, the head of corporate finance and development. So I was responsible for all the capital markets activity as well as the M&A activity. We did a bond deal um, and I was, uh, I, you know, I, I was, I couldn't sleep. I was, I was so focused on every little detail, everything in the indenture, every little, uh, clause every every basis point of the pricing I was I was sweating over in a way that I never did as a banker because you know at the end of the day as a banker you want the deal to go well you want it to get the thing done and then you move on to the next one uh, but as a company working in a company you live with the impact of those decisions that you make every day and so thinking about corporate finance in an operational context and how it, it works in concert with with the business and how you can be a partner to the business uh, was really important. Um, and I, I worked uh, with Chris Winfrey, who was the CFO at Charter, uh, and became a great teacher uh, in sort of helping me broaden out my finance toolkit and be more operationally focused, which led me to this final chapter where now I'm the CFO of Turo. Uh, and you come, every, you know, every CFO comes into the role you know, through some path through the finance world. Maybe you come up through accounting. Maybe you come up through banking. Maybe you're an FP&A professional. It, naturally, you come through one of those roles. But when you get into the CFO role, you learn that it is a much broader, more operationally focused role than you expected. You spend a, a lot of your time doing things that have really very little to do with finance. You're, you're a partner to the, to the HR lead. You're a partner to the marketing team. You're a partner to the engineering team you need to think about and have an appetite for and an interest in all aspects of the business. Um, because really what you're there to do is to help support those, those, those leaders and those parts of the business 
um, and uh, and and provide them with tools and visibility and and really kind of the the scaffolding and support to help the company grow. Well, that's a nice uh, overview for us. Some nice takeaways. Thank you, uh, Chuck. I want to. Uh, I, I always do this. I have to take you back to uh, 2008 in Lehman. You're you're not alone. It seems like there's a whole recent class of CFOs, people who've entered the office recently, who all have this chapter. Uh, but for you, I mean, you know, you were 10 years into your career, professional life. You, you've you already succeeded in so many ways. And then um, the financial crisis, of course, happens and, and Lehman collapses. Now, in short order, you're, you, you're back, you're on your feet, you land on your feet, you, t- you step into another managing director role at a financial institution. But still, can you go back in time for us, though, and just share what you experienced at that time? I mean, it's a piece of history that the, frankly is going to be written about in history books someday. And you experienced it. Your, your great grandkids are going to ask you, uh, you were there? That happened? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, 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 it was uh, a very formative uh, moment in my life, not just my career, but my life to be to be living through that. Um, for, you know, for, it was exacerbated in fact, by the, by the fact uh, that I was an expat living in London at the time this happened. So when, you know, uh, I had uprooted from New York, uh, I moved over to London with my, my family, I had two young kids. My wife was pregnant at the time and, uh, we were all there. And when you're an expat living abroad, uh, at least at that time, all of your life is kind of organized through the firm that put you there. So, so it was our connection to the UK was Lehman Brothers. So there we are in this foreign country. We're loving it. We're having a great time. But then this is happening. You're watching it all unfold. And as uh, you know, as a managing director, you know, you're relatively senior in the bank, but you actually don't have a lot of visibility into what's happening. Uh, you know, you're, you're sort of a, you know, you're, a, you're like a salesperson selling these products for the bank but you don't have a visibility to what's happening uh, in the C-suite. And so I'm watching all of this unfold like everybody else. I'm getting information from CNBC and from reading the paper. And obviously everybody's talking in the halls about what's happening. Everybody's convincing themselves that we're going to be fine. Oh, we're going to be fine. Oh, don't worry. You know, that was Bear Stearns that we're different from Bear. We'll be fine. And, and the, (laughs) And so you watch it and every day it gets a little worse and every day it gets a little worse and every day until that final weekend. And I remember so well that final weekend when, you know, all the negotiations were taking place down at the New York Fed and all the, you know, the heads of all the banks and Paulson and everybody was there trying to decide what to do. Do they bail the banks out? Do they, you know, moral hazard was a, a term that I learned in that, in that process. I didn't, I hadn't heard moral hazard before and that became very, something we all became familiar with. Uh, and I remember it was the Sunday night coming into Monday morning that the bankruptcy would file at midnight New York time. And I'm in London, so five hours ahead. I didn't sleep a wink. I lay there waiting for 5 a.m. to arrive when I would see, did we or did we not file for bankruptcy? At the time, it was a BlackBerry, not an iPhone. I look at my BlackBerry, Lehman files for bankruptcy get in the car and drive down to Canary Wharf where we were, where we were getting ready to see what would happen. And I, I remember very vividly Christian Meisner, who's the head of European investment banking. He was as shell shocked as the rest of us. Everybody was sort of looking around saying, what do we do? He said to everybody gathered that morning. All right, folks, we'll, you're all going to be fired. It's not a question of if it's just when there may be a handful of you who will be kept on to help wrap things up, but everybody else, Go up to your office, pack things up. If you're a managing director and you have a mandate, you've got business that is live, call up the clients and resign because obviously we're done. And then, you know, pack up your things and we'll, uh, we'll see, you know, you'll get your final paycheck whenever they sort through that. And so everybody did what he said. In fact, the very first call that I made was to Chris Winfrey, who was at the time the CFO of Unity Media, which was a German cable company. And we were one of the book runners on their pending IPO. I called Chris and I said, hi, Chris, I'm really sorry, but I have to tell you that we need to resign. You know, this has just happened. He said, don't worry. Thank you for calling. First of all, I hope you're all right. And don't worry, we won't be going public anytime soon with this, what's happening in the capital markets. 
that's the same Chris who I end up working for at Charter Communications. Um, he moved back to the U.S. I ultimately moved back to the U.S. We stayed in touch. He became a client of mine when I was back in New York, and then ultimately he became my boss. But it was a surreal moment. Um, it was uh, something that stuck with me. And in fact, the lessons from that time came back uh, in recent days with these regional banking collapses with Silicon Valley Bank and, and First Republic. And, uh, I, you know, I'm in a network with a bunch of other CFOs. And as you know, Silicon Valley Bank supports many, many startups. And a lot of my peers had a lot of their cash and all of their sort of lines of credit tied up in Silicon Valley Bank. And I was watching everybody go through the motions to try to figure out, is SVB going to survive and what am I going to do? Uh, it, it really brought me back to 2008 in a in a not so good way. Yeah, some great uh, recollections there for us. And uh, just the sense of helplessness. I, I mean, every employee, of course, of Lehman experienced that. But to have been an expat at that place in time, just the uh, the sense of helplessness uh, is magnified, one would imagine. And uh, again, there there were so many things, whether it's taxes uh, related or what have you, that uh, when you go abroad, uh, the, the mothership uh, accommodates you in different ways. I just can't imagine. No, absolutely. I mean, my, my, my lease was uh, through Lehman was the was the lessee on our our flat that we owned uh, our my kids school the Lehman paid the bill for the kids school and they garnished my wages they did the taxes um, all of that obviously my visa to be in the UK um, and at the time and, and if you remember Barclays acquired Lehman very shortly after the bankruptcy and I was a US employee seconded to the UK so I thought I had been acquired by Barclays all of the expats sort of were chatting and saying, oh, I guess we work for Barclays now. But that was, in fact, not the deal. They, they decided they're going to only acquire the employees that were sitting domiciled in the U.S. and everybody else was. One can only imagine what the, the first uh, 30 days past that must have been like. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for that. And um, again, when you, you know, as you move forward, I guess you have some sense. Well, I, we got through that came out the other end. So that means something. It gives you confidence as you face future crises. What's, you know, what's the, uh, the biggest takeaway, I guess. Yeah. I mean, the biggest takeaway, the thing that, that sticks with me from that time, um, is the power of, of preparation and the, the, the idea that when that, that, that risks are more correlated than you think they are. And that was the thing that I, I, I learned and, it's, and, and I saw this again happen with Silicon Valley Bank. But anytime these things start to go, the snowball starts to pick up steam and things that you didn't think were related will be related. So um, here's an example in the Silicon Valley Bank situation. Um, everybody was saying, OK, well, uh, I've got my cash there and that's a problem. But. I just need to sort that bit out and everything else is fine. Well, what about your payroll? Now, you, if your payroll provider, it, it, second order effects, your payroll provider uses Silicon Valley Bank. What about your vendors? If they use Silicon Valley Bank, what about if you're not at Silicon Valley Bank, but you happen to be at First Republic Bank, that's a similar bank that has similar characteristics and on and on and on. And all of a sudden you think that it's insulated, that the risk, the perimeter of damage is, is something and then it quickly ripples out and goes further and further and further. And so in the very first instance, we at Turo were fortunate. We had no exposure to Silicon Valley Bank um, in, in, in directly. We had no money with them. They didn't do any banking with them. We had no lines of credit. But I be, immediately began to think because of my Lehman experience, I thought, OK, where do we go next? And I had the whole team go back and look at all of our key vendor relationships and find out what their exposure to Silicon Valley Bank was. Look at all of our employees. Do they have personal bank accounts with SVB so that we could pause payroll for those people, give them time to set up a new banking relationship so that their paycheck wouldn't get go into SVB and get trapped there. Same thing with our hosts. In Turo, we've got a network of hosts that you know, we're the platform that provides the, um, you know, the vehicle for them to build a business. I don't want payments going into SVB and them getting trapped. So we paused all of our AP, our accounts payable on that Friday evening to make sure that we weren't sending any money out to any vendors, any hosts, any employees that could end up ultimately getting trapped at SVB. 
wait, find out, sort through all of that, figure out what the second and third order relationships were, and then, you know, restart from there. Wow. So, so it really did uh, influence your thinking and gave, put you on a heightened state of alert, I guess. That. Yeah, yeah, no, it did. It, it's, uh, it, is, um, it was a good lesson in understanding that it, uh, they'll, they'll, you'll find a bottom, but it can, it can always get worse. Yeah, yeah. The, the other area of your career I thought was interesting too, because many, I think, corporate development folks and others could relate to is uh, when you wanted to understand better the operational side, I think you mentioned that there was the CFO really helped you do that. Whether and I'm wondering if there was a way he did that, whether he or she did that, whether it was uh, having you sit in on meetings or whether you know you expressed this interest and there was just you know he was thrilled, sure, or was it less um, less direct than that? You know, it, so when I came when I joined Charter, my my role was uh, was. Uh, it was the SVP of corporate finance. Uh, and my responsibility was very much like kind of the in-house banker. I was doing the capital markets. I was responsible for the balance sheet and all the M&A activity. And, and over time, and that, that was a big enough role. There was lots to do there. But um, over time, I became interested in trying to expand my horizons and see the bigger sort of cross-section of the finance toolkit uh, and Chris, uh, who was my boss, was Winfrey, the CFO at Charter, was always drilling into me and to everybody that he worked with that the focus of our efforts should be in support of the operations and that he as a CFO spent his day, like his day job was the operations. His after, you know, six o'clock job was the transactional stuff, the the banking, the the M and A deals, like you know, reading pitch books, thinking about ideas for 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 uh, for for M and A, all that kind of stuff. That came after. What you focused on during the day was, uh, you know, helping to support the business. So, partly through osmosis and learning from him, watching how he worked, how he spent his time, how he organized his attention, uh, his focus gave me some perspective into the insights of what you need to do. But also he was, I was fortunate that he gave me broader uh, responsibility and expanded my role. So over time I took on oversight uh, of the investor relations department. So I was leading the IR team. Uh, after a little while, I also took on procurement and procurement was a fantastic window into the entire business. Here you're, you know, Charter is a company that spent uh, probably it, and upwards of $10 billion a year on procurement, uh, all the software and systems and, and, and things, everything non-programming related that Charter spent money on. Uh, we have this massive team that was working through procurement. And so procurement was a way to see how the business works, how business leaders make decisions, how you can add value by focusing on all the small details. Um, and, all of those small details, one of the things that, that I eventually also later uh, came to oversee Treasury, and we had a weekly meeting with, uh, with the Treasury team at, that Chris, the CFO, would sit in on where we would look at all of the payments going out that week. Uh, every week we would look at it and we would just line by line, look at those payables and ask ourselves, does that look right? Does that look right? And there was, there was a lesson, there were two lessons in that exercise. One was focusing on all the small things matters. They all add up and you should not lose sight of that. Even in a company that was, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars in market cap, but where Turo was or, or Charter was when I, when I eventually uh, left there, very, very big business. But Chris would focus on every small detail. There's no detail too small. So that was one thing that was, was helpful. But the other thing that was a learning from that exercise was the modeling of that behavior. When people in the organization see that the CFO of a company that big is focusing on line items, you know, as small as $1,000 or $10,000 or whatever the item may be, or whatever the detail may be, it's not too small for, for the CFO to focus on. That sends a message that goes all the way down through the organization that if this person in this role with this much scope and this much responsibility is paying, is sweating the details, I better sweat the details too. And that, I think that modeling of that behavior um, was something that I've taken with me. I think it was a great lesson. Well, that's great, great uh, insight there for us. So thank you for that. And of course, 
you leave Charter and you you step into the CFO role at Turo. Let's find out about this company now. Let's uh, let's uh, hear about the opportunity that you saw. What is this company about? What does it do? Yeah, well, it, it's 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 phenomenal. You know, I, Turo is the world's largest peer-to-peer car sharing marketplace. So for for folks who haven't heard of it, you you probably heard of Airbnb, and you could think of Turo as the Airbnb for cars. We we help connect uh, people with with vehicles, and, and what our mission is is to put the world's one and a half billion cars to better use. Vehicles, you know, in the United States, the average car sits idle. 95% of the time, you know, and cars are expensive. It's an expensive asset for anyone. It's a depreciating asset. And if we can make better use of those underutilized assets, we think it was a, a fantastic opportunity. Um, we have built this marketplace now to operate in five countries. We're, we're, co- we're in every state in the union. Uh, we're in Canada, the UK. Last year, we acquired a business in France. So we're now in France operating under the brand WeCar. Uh, and we just launched in Australia last year. So we're in five markets um, and we intend to continue to grow. I think this is a, it, every marketplace business that builds a network effect that gets a network gets stronger when you add nodes to that network. So we want to be in more places. Effectively, our mission is to be ubiquitous. We want to be everywhere that people are traveling to and going from. We want to have vehicles everywhere that you are, because one of the reasons that we are successful, one of the reasons that we have done so well is partly because of our unique selection. We have over 1,400 makes and models on the on the platform. That is uh, a uh, you know a point of differentiation that that can't be replicated. If you think about the traditional rental car model, it is about you know it is sort of about uh, utility and um, and uh, you know standards formats. We have you know unique makes and models from the most expensive car you can imagine to something you might be nostalgic for from your teenage years. Um, and we have the most convenient um, service, in selection and convenience. We have a network of, of hosts who will provide vehicles everywhere that you, you live and you travel from. We, you know, we, we have a, a, a service that provides delivery uh, for guests so that you can arrive at a hotel or maybe where you live, you don't own a vehicle. A host will deliver the car to you for your trip and you drop your car right off where you live. Uh, it couldn't be more convenient. Um, when I joined in uh, March of 2021, if you cast your mind back to that point in time, we were just coming out of the pandemic. You know, vaccinations were taking hold. People were starting to travel again. Uh, Turo in 2020 went through kind of an existential moment where it wasn't sure it was even going to survive as, as the world was shutting down. Um, it, it actually quickly rebound, actually grew its top line revenue in 2020 by 6%. And then in 21, people started to travel in, in a way that we, was unexpected. The business absolutely exploded. Uh, and as I said, we did we probably did about 150 million of revenue in 2020. And we ultimately ended up tripling the business in 2021. Uh, ended the year with $469 million of revenue, 213% growth because people were traveling and they were traveling domestically. They, were, they weren't going overseas, they were staying in the US and they wanted to get out of the house. And this was the same time that the traditional rental car companies had all defleeted during COVID to try to stay alive, to stay, stay out of bankruptcy. Hertz ultimately did go bankrupt, but, uh, but those that stayed out of bankruptcy dramatically reduced their fleet size. So here you have a moment in time when everybody's traveling, demand is insatiable and and, and frankly, people aren't excited to get on airplanes. So they're, they're, you know, getting in cars. It feels like a safer way to travel and there's not very much supply. So we were able to support our hosts in growing their businesses. We invested uh, a significant amount of money into scaling our platform, scaling our team, supporting our hosts by providing them with more of the uh, kind of more of the economics of the, of these transactions, making it more, uh, compelling for people to scale their fleets if they're a small, uh, you know, entrepreneur trying to build a business, um, and and it was a tremendous year for us. We were profitable for the first time, um, and as I said, we grew the business, uh, you know, threefold. And at the same time, we're doing all that. We were working furiously behind the scenes trying to get the company ready to go public. And we ultimately got ourselves on file in the summer of 2021, um, and. 
in a sort of a, a situation of better to be lucky than good, we ultimately didn't go public in the, in the fall. We decided to wait and we waited. Um, and, and that's turned out to be a good thing. Um, as you saw, 2021 was a great year for IPOs, but not a tremendously successful year for a lot of the companies that went public in that year. Um, 22 was it was a tough year for the capital market. So we're happy to have been private. We had a terrific 22, continued to grow top line almost 60% to almost $750 million, uh, still profitable um, and uh, on a great trajectory. Can you, uh, so it's, it remains private, but can you give us maybe a short history of its capital structure where there, does it go far back yeah. this company or? No. Yeah, so the company's been around uh, since uh, 2009, so for quite a long time. Uh, it has gone through five rounds of private capital raising, uh, Series A through Series E. Our, our original founding uh, venture capital firm was uh, August Partners. Um, Howard Hartenbaum was the, was the lead partner there that led that investment and ultimately actually attracted Andre Haddad, our CEO, into the role. Uh, and, and Howard's still there. He is, he's been supportive. He's on the board, hasn't sold a share. Um, and he's a, he's a fantastic partner and great supporter. He led the Series A. Along the way, we, we did uh, you know, a B, C, and D rounds with various other uh, Silicon Valley VC firms, names that you'd have heard of, um, like Google Ventures and Kleiner Perkins and Canaan Partners. Um, we also had some strategic investors um, over time. And then finally, in 2019, August of 19, our Series E was led by IAC, Interactive Corp., the Barry Diller company. Um, and they, they, they made a $250 million investment in the company. It was the largest round, and it was our final round. Um, we're, as I said, we're now profitable, um, so when we've got a very healthy balance sheet, so we're not doing any more fundraising. But they came in. They, they ultimately uh, bought about 27% of the company in that, in that round and have taken two seats on the board and have been terrific partners. They're, they're great operators. So it's always good to have certainly, you know, venture capital investors are great partners. They're great in the boardroom. They've seen a lot of things. They bring a lot of expertise from their, uh, you know, their portfolio. But having somebody like I see who brings both a financial and an operational lens, they run businesses and they're, they've been in the trenches and they know what it takes and they, they can provide you with insights around, you know, how to manage um, your SEM strategies and your SEO strategies and, and how to think about brand advertising and, and any of those kinds of questions that companies wrestle with as they're, as they're growing. Um, they've been through all that. Um, so they've been very supportive and very helpful. We're lucky to have them on the team. Yeah. And, and for someone like yourself that, you know, you sort of have a point of comparison, just given all of what IAC, the types of businesses it's been involved with, they understand what, the needs of a finance function are. I'm wondering if you in any way architected your finance function, uh, given the advice from IAC or somewhere else, board members, as you look to see the type of talent that you required uh, to execute correctly, as you evaluated your lines of sight into the business, whether you were getting the numbers you wanted to see when you wanted to see them, uh, whether you had to improve your lines of sight. Can you share with us, you know, what you discovered over time? You know, I, initially when you showed up, maybe you didn't have everything you wanted. Yeah. Yeah, no, you you, you know, you come into the role and, um, you know, I, I, I come in with a, with strength in capital markets and, and understanding balance sheets and capital structure, um, you know, the speaking to the markets, you know, my, my investor relations experience was helpful there. My time as a banker was helpful there, but I didn't bring uh, a deep account a background in accounting, for example. Um, that was, as you think about the, the kind of the, the functional responsibilities for a CFO, there's people who bring kind of the outward facing stuff like the capital markets. There's the FP&A folks who are kind of an operational finance lens. And then there's accounting. And I think about those as kind of the three big legs of the stool in the, in the CFO uh, orbit. I was pretty familiar with the FP&A piece, very comfortable with the capital markets piece, not as much familiarity with or, or expertise or background with the accounting piece. And one piece of advice that I got from Glenn Schiffman, who was at the time the CFO of uh, IAC, and he was the guy that, if you remember back to my Lehman days, he was my sort of mentor, sponsor, friend at Lehman. 
he went from a banking role into a CFO role. And he said to me, you know, one of the things that you should remember is you're going to have areas in your job that you're comfortable with and areas in your job you're left com less comfortable with. Go to the places where you're less comfortable. Focus your time on the places where you, you are not as familiar. That's going to be, that will serve you well down the road to invest in, in, in those areas. And so for me, that was accounting. And I spent a lot of time with our accounting team. We have a great team. But one thing you learn as a company that is kind of in Turo stage then, it was sort of in its adolescence. It wasn't a, you know, a startup with bootstrapping it, but it wasn't a full fledged, you know, mature company that was ready for and existing in the public markets environment with all the disciplines and the processes and the systems that go with that. So I spent a lot of time working with our accounting team, helping shore up both the team. We needed to add more people. We, we needed to just get more, more, um, you know, more bodies in to help process the work, but we also had to put in place more uh, repeatable processes. We needed to put in place tools and systems that took some of the manual work out of all the, the things that accountants do, the closing of the books. And if you think about going into the public markets, everybody's focus in the, the IPO process is on the getting public part. You know, getting the S1 ready, doing the roadshow, figuring out your pitch. What are you gonna sell to investors? What's the structure of the deal gonna be? That's all very important, obviously. But that's think about that in the like the analogy. That's like getting the lock, the rocket launched. Well, then you have to think about what's life in space going to be like. Can we actually live in space now that we're out there? So you've got the company public. Can you function as a public company? Can you close your books on time? Can 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 you do it in a way that's accurate and dependable and repeatable so that when you sign those financial statements, you have faith that everything's going to be right? I mean. When you're public, you're in a no-fail environment. You can't have a misstatement. You, you know, you you have to be able to be uh, very comfortable that you can repeat these processes quickly. So we spent a lot of time working on, you know, developing our our internal capabilities and our visibility into how the business was operating. You know, Turo, it's a it's a business that has a lot of small dollar transactions, a lot of transaction volume. So that creates complexity for the accounting team. And, you know, it's interesting. Uh, we'd be interested in learning what are you paying attention to? I mean, repeat customers are part of it, clearly. But as you said, small transactions. So uh, is it is it uh, understanding how your marketing dollars are creating demand? What, what are you trying to better understand? Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, t t one one thing that's great about Turo is we are a very data driven and data oriented company. We we gather and and study and uh, disseminate a lot of information about the business. Almost anything that you could think about, we're tracking it and measuring it. And so with all of that information, you do have to figure out what, what do you, how do you sort through that and find the things that matter that you want to pay attention to. Um, and, and certainly, you know, attracting demand is, is important to us. And we think about our, our marketing performance and being very efficient on the, on customer acquisition cost. One very important and impressive thing about our, our business is almost 80% of our traffic is organic. People find us, we don't pay for that traffic. If you think about any sort of internet or marketplace focused business, acquiring uh, demand is, is a very expensive proposition. So when 80% of your demand is free, um, that's, that's fantastic. So we, we do focus on being very efficient on the demand uh, spend that we do against that 20% that we're acquiring. Um, but fundamentally, I think about our business and how we're going to grow from the perspective of gaining market share. And we think about that in volume terms. And so for us, that's about days. So days, trip days taken on the platform is kind of our volume metric. Last year, we grew trip days almost 75% uh, to 2.9 million days. And, and so that was that's the kind of the, the top of the funnel, as it were. You think about that days, the next big metric that I focus on is GBV or gross booking value. And that is the value of all the money that's spent on the platform multiplied by the number of days. So that is a, sort of your proxy for the size of the opportunity. If, you're, if you were to compare Turo to Hertz or Avis, you'd be comparing our GBV, which is that is kind of like equivalent to revenue for Hertz or Avis. Um, because the next thing is our net revenue, which is just our take rate, our percentage of that GBV that we keep. Um, we obviously track that. We you know, we grew GBV last year by 75%. Uh, 
Um, we grew our net revenue by 59%, well, almost $750 million. And then obviously I track uh, all the profitability metrics from there, from gross profit down to contribution profit and all the way down to EBITDA. Um, we also take a very close look at and monitor our cohort performance because as you, as you mentioned, um, attracting customers is great, retaining customers is even better. Building a lifetime value of, of a customer uh, is where you really generate real ROI. And we look at our uh, host and guest retention metrics. Because when you think about a marketplace, it's both the supply and the demand side. And at any one point in time, you're focusing as a platform a little bit maybe more on building up supply where you need it. And other times it's a bit, little bit more of a push on the demand side, but it's always working together. And it's kind of when the flywheel gets spinning and it's working well, both the supply and the demand side are growing uh, kind of in equal measure. And last year we grew our uh, demand by almost 75% and we grew supply by about 67%. So we have now over 320,000 active listings on the platform. Um, so I'm looking at that and looking at how we retain those hosts and guests. And if if you look at our cohort charts, look at how our hosts and our guests are retained over time, uh, our cohort performances, we'll put it up against any other marketplace that you'll you'll see. It's it's really, really great um, shape of uh, of the development. Yeah, just such an interesting sort of uh, marketplace. Now, discussing supply, uh, the hosts. Yeah. <laughs> Seems funny, funny word for a car owner, I suppose. Uh <laughs> Do do uh do you have to spend marketing dollars to attract those or is it word of mouth or no there's actual marketing that's devoted in both spaces yeah yeah no it, we we actually we don't we don't spend much on host acquisition if you think about our how we've grown our host community over time about half of the growth comes from existing hosts adding more vehicles to their oh. to their fleet growing uh, from, you know, what we, we've segmented our host community into what we call uh, um, consumer hosts who have one to two cars. So think of that's about, you know, you or me, we've got a car that's not being used very often. And we put it on the platform and it's a really effective way to offset the cost of vehicle ownership. Once people do that, they start with their own vehicle and they realize, huh, this is actually pretty compelling. It's not that difficult. I'm making a good money here. Maybe I'm going to get another car. But this one is just going to be for Turo. And so they go and buy a used vehicle and they finance it and they put it on the platform. Uh, and then that becomes their Turo car. And then that, that goes, the second one begets a third. When you go in this, what we segment the three to nine vehicle host is called a small business host. And then 10 plus is a professional host. And so while we don't, we don't spend marketing dollars attracting them, as I said, half of our growth comes from existing hosts building their fleet. Half is new, therefore, and of those new hosts that join the platform for the first time, half of those were guests before they were hosts. So they've found their way to Turo through the experience on the other side of the transaction. And we found that uh, the, 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 the host experience, uh, the way that this marketplace works is because of that relationship between the host and guests and because our hosts do such a good job in providing you know, these delightful, unique experiences for our guests. So we've invested, instead of investing money, acquiring or attracting or marketing to hosts, we've invested in supporting our hosts. We've built a host, host success team that's now approximately 100 people that's devoted to helping our hosts manage their business. Every host now that comes on the platform before they can send their car out for their first trip has to go through an onboarding experience so that they understand exactly what to do when their first uh, guest shows up. Because the moment they press... Uh, you know, play on their on their uh, listing, and the listing goes live. They should expect that their demand is going to start to to come in. So we spend a lot of time making sure they're ready, that they've got good photos for their listing, that they've got an accurate description, but importantly, that they're there and ready with a vehicle that's safe and clean, uh, on time, where it's supposed to be, that communicate effectively with with their guests, that they fulfill their trips, that they're dependable. Um, and with that kind of education and the support that we provide, we then were able to help them grow their business. So we'll help them think about making good decisions around pricing and around vehicle choices and around financing and insurance. So if, if you happen to have a, maybe you've got a, you know, a, a Toyota Corolla on the platform and you're thinking about a second vehicle, well, you'll talk to your host success team and we'll say, all right, Jack, you know, I know you live in, in upstate New York and you've got a, Corolla, how about thinking about a four-wheel drive vehicle? That would be great for the winter. Or maybe a seven-seater, something that's going to be great for families. 
And by the way, if you're looking at a minivan, the 2017 Toyota Sienna is a great one. And we find that that's better value than the 18. So you'll, we'll help you with those kind of decisions. So you help you scale your business in an, in an effective and intelligent way and manage through all of those growing pains as you, as you continue to, uh, to go on your hosting journey. Excellent. Good, good detail there for us. Thank you for that. I want to ask you, is this a hybrid organization and was there a decision, uh, you know, regarding remote one way or the other uh, that management came to during COVID or does it go back longer? Yeah. Yeah. So when I joined, I I actually joined at a time when the company was 100 percent virtual because in March of 21, uh, you know, things were still pretty locked down. Uh, And so everything was on Zoom at that point in time. Nobody was in the office. But by the fall of 2021, we got we we were back. We we decided as a company that it was going to be the right thing for us to be in the office, not five days a week, but we were going to be three days a week. And every team could make a decision with their team as to what those three days would be. It might be Tuesday through Thursday for some, Monday through Wednesday for others. But you'd be there in the office as a, as a group. Now, in at that time, particularly for a Bay Area focused company uh, that was hungry for product development and engineering talent like we were, um, hiring was a challenge. And Hiring in an environment where you were requiring people to be the off in the office was serving to be an impediment for us for that kind of talent. And as we got into the, into the beginning of 2022, we had put our plan for the year in front of our board, and they were you know were talking about the 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 risks. And one of the board members said, "Okay, looking at at this plan, what do you think is going to be the biggest risk or impediment to achieving this these goals?" And our CEO said. I have no, no question. The biggest risk will be hiring and retaining talent. That's what that's going to, if, if we can hire the right people and retain the team that we have, we'll be successful. If we, if we aren't able to do that, we won't be. So they said, okay, well, how's that going? We said, well, we're having some trouble finding new people. Why? Well, because we have this in office policy and nobody like wants to be in the office right now. So the board said, okay, get rid of it. <laughs> so we said, Okay, let's do it. Let's give it a shot. And so we we went we went flexible. So we have a a policy now. From that moment, we didn't look back. We said, "All right, we're going to change this." We still want to bring people together, and we do uh, spend time in the office. We still have physical office locations in San Francisco and Phoenix and Toronto, London, Paris, Sydney. We've got offices, and people come in. Um, but you don't have to. It's not a requirement, and you no longer need to live you know, in this, in the city that the office is located. I'm talking to you today from New York. We don't have an office in New York. Um, we've allowed people to live in the States where we already have a taxable presence. Um, so that's about uh, 10 or 11 States around the country. Um, and then we bring people together twice a year for a week long gathering that we call turbo week, where everybody comes together once in, in the spring, it's in San Francisco in the fall, it's in Phoenix. Um, and everybody comes together uh, for those kind of week long gatherings. It's social, it's informational. It brings people back in touch with their colleagues and reminds them of the, the things that kind of stitch us together as a company, as a culture. As you discuss these types of things, these decisions related to the workforce with human uh, resources, uh, professionals, your HR leader, perhaps, um, is there a discussion around, you know, employee engagement? Uh, is there is there concern of that the people are being managed properly now that it's sort of a strange uh, environment that's over Zoom and not in person? Yeah, yeah it, it, something we talk about a lot, um, as you can imagine. It, it it was the the decision to go remote was one that you know we met with a lot of trepidation. We were worried about how that would all unfold for some of the reasons that you talk about. And I think there is some discomfort as leaders and as management team about having your workforce distributed. And you're not seeing them every day in the office. So, you know, how is this all working? Um, but we, we, we take real uh, pains to um, make sure that our managers understand um, how they need to work with their teams and have to maybe engage a little bit harder on some of the mentoring and the uh, the learning and the um, sort of the team building stuff that might be a little bit more difficult to happen in a virtual environment. Um, we are 
always talking to our teams about uh, all these, asking these questions and asking people how they're feeling, making sure that people aren't left behind. We've done, uh, we do a twice a year, we do a survey uh, that asks our employees a whole range of questions about how they're feeling, their level of engagement with their job, how they're feeling about their career development opportunities, how they feel about their mentoring. Um, all of those kinds of questions we're keeping a close eye on to make sure that we we feel like uh, you know people are are getting the development that they need and that we're in touch with um, with the the progress that people are making. We give everybody at the company a learning and development stipend that they can spend um, as they choose to make sure that they're finding those kinds of opportunities. Um, and, uh, and, and we found that productivity has been, uh, particularly for the, for the hybrid folks who have uh, you know, come into the office uh, at least part of the time, we found that productivity uh, has remained as high, if not higher, um, than when we were in the, the traditional kind of go to the office five days a week type of format. Interesting. Thank you for that uh, insight there. We're going to jump to our finance strategic moment question. Again, this may have happened anytime during the course of your career. We're just looking for a moment of insight that you experienced because of your lines of sight into the organization as a finance executive. You responded to an opportunity. Maybe you pursued one. Maybe it was a risk you avoided. I don't know. But what comes to mind when we ask for a finance strategic moment? You know, I think for me, the, the, the one thing that one stands out for me was back at my time at Charter Communications. I had just joined there in 2013. Uh, and we were at that time, I would say a mid-sized company, mid-sized cable operator. We were known as very good operators. Tom Rutledge was the CEO. He and his team of, of, of operators were known through the industry to be really, really kind of top class in terms of the nuts and bolts of running a cable system. And we were best in class in terms of our pricing strategies and our margins and our growth and all that looked great. But we were, you know, mid-size. We were, we were not in the, the upper echelon uh, in, this, in the industry. And I remember sitting with Tom at a meeting one day and we were talking about the business and the landscape. And we were talking about how well we were doing in some areas. And he said, you know, the thing that we need to understand as a company is that we can be the best operators in the business. And I think we are, but we're subscale. And as long as we're subscale, we're always going to be playing the game by somebody else's rules. We are not going to have a seat at the table to define the direction of the industry. So all the gains that we will make will be incremental unless we can build scale and have a seat at that table to help shape the direction of where we're going to go and where the industry is going to go. So we need to, we need to be bold. And that sort of clarity around that one big question, which was sort of it, as much as you focus on all the day-to-day -day details, unless you can fix this one thing, it's not going to move the needle in, and sort of create step function change and value creation for shareholders uh, unless you solve that thing. That became that became the guiding principle for us as an organization. And, and it was at that almost that very same day that we as a team began thinking about and embarking upon a, what was a very bold and, and three year pursuit of an acquisition that was Time Warner Cable. Time Warner Cable was a company that was, I don't know, maybe three or four times bigger than Charter. It was audacious to think that we would be the acquirer of Time Warner Cable in every every logical <laughs> construction of how industries evolve, they would be acquiring us. But we thought we should be acquiring them. And we thought we were better operators and we thought that we had a better strategy. And we thought if we could figure out how to do this, and it wasn't gonna be easy to figure out how to do it, how to raise the money, how to put the capital structures together so that all of their debt, which was investment grade, could marry together with all of our debt, which was high yield, we had, at the time, we were an $8 billion market cap and $12 billion of debt. And they were probably, I don't know, a $75 or $80 billion company. And so we were going to be, this was the minnow swallowing the whale. So we had to figure this out. It, it took, it ultimately took three years. Uh, this was a transaction that took many twists and turns. It was hostile at one point. We thought we had won the bid and then Comcast came and actually ended up making a bid for the business. The 
Department of Justice ultimately turned them down, told them that they couldn't complete the transaction. So Time Warner Cable came back up into the market again. We then swooped back in and, and were able to close the deal. Um, it was, it, you know, it, there's many, many stories uh, in that three-year journey, um, and it was a fantastic learning experience. But it was started from that moment of strategic clarity from Tom, saying that, you know, we need to make a big swing here. We need to do something audacious. And we might not be successful, but we have to try. And getting that deal done fundamentally changed Charter. I mean, it, it really did. By the time I left, the business was probably a $150 billion market cap, uh, you know, and it was eight when I joined. Um, you know, it was probably something like $80 billion of debt, um, very well managed balance sheet. Uh, it, the transaction was a game changer for Charter, it changed the industry, changed the landscape. Um, and it was uh, and it was because of Tom's kind of clarity and his aggressiveness and his boldness around pursuing a vision that he thought was the critical kind of the critical um, factor in driving um, ultimate success. From episode 894, this is One Minute with Julie Swinney, CFO of Zendesk. Um, so when I thought about kind of the business priorities, first, focus on establishing the financial trajectory for a balanced growth strategy. You know, history was more anchored towards growth, um, and now it needed to be balanced growth. In other words, profitable growth. Um, so how I went about doing that is started by developing a set of what we now call our page zero metrics. And those set the course for our rule of 50 plus performance. Um, in the software space, you'll often hear about the rule of 40 or the rule of 50. Um, so, you know, we don't aim low, we, we aim for, for best in class. So rule of 50 plus performance. That is essentially revenue growth plus cash-based profitability margin and basically set out a five-year trajectory. We're going to jump to our mentoring round where I'll ask you several quick questions intended to inform and inspire future finance leaders. We're wondering, uh, as you think back to your first 30 days in the CFO role, what is the piece of advice? It wasn't all that long ago, but if you could just step back in time and just give you that one piece of advice that maybe would have been useful to you as you came through the door, what would that be? Yeah, I mean, I think that the... You think that you, you th I think you come into the CFO role thinking you understand the the dimensions that are required of you in in that in that job, and when you get there, you realize that it's much broader than you expected. That the the areas of engagement and the areas that you need to have energy for and focus on go much beyond the traditional finance toolkit that you come in with and you prepared for. You're going to be immediately drawn into questions and, and discussions about um, people, about uh, marketing, about, uh, you know, uh, uh, real estate decisions. The, the, the range and the scope of what your, your purview is, is as broad as the organization itself. And so one thing that, that I would have, uh, said to myself is make sure you're, you're ready and you're thinking about and, um, and have, uh, you know, curiosity for all of those aspects of the business. Cause to be a good CFO is to be a partner with all of those people and all those teams and all those uh, organizations. Um, the other thing is, is something that I touched on earlier is the focus on all the small details you know, there it's a big job and sometimes the detail can be overwhelming, but it's important to, to drill down and keep an eye on, on, um, you know, the little things as well as the big, that's, that's important because all the little things add up, but also because it shows your team that you're paying attention and it helps them, uh, model that behavior down through the organization. Um, and, um, you know, and just, uh, you know, be supportive of your team. Um, it, it, it's, uh, it really is, uh, it takes a whole range of people, uh, that, that, pulling to coming together to, to pull the, to, to, um, to help the, the organization, uh, be successful. And, um, and at, at different points in time along the, the journey, 
different people are going to need help and support and, uh, and helping hand. And so make sure that you're paying attention and supporting your team. We always like to ask our guests to reflect a little bit on the personal side with us. We're wondering if you are known for a personal habit, part of a daily routine, something that sets you apart. Is there something you do that people point out <laughs> and just say, you know, that's what Chuck does. That's how he's always done it. I don't know. Uh, anything uh, to mind? <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't know. I think that, um, you know, in terms of personal habits, there's that I, I may, uh, I'm a, I'm a list keeper. I don't think I could get through my day without, uh, every day laying out my to-do list. Um, I'm, I, I'm an old fashioned, uh, paper and pen person. I like to write it down, um, and cross things off and I seeing it there and being tactile and tangible helps me, uh, somehow it just sort of declutters my brain. And if I can take it all out of here and put it on paper, it doesn't seem to work as well for me when I do it on the screen. I've tried using different, uh, tools and devices, but I always go back to paper and pencil. Um, exercise is another sort of daily routine. I think I, I, I every day I try to get some exercise in first thing in the morning, it sets the tone for the day. Um, and, uh, I just don't feel, uh, I have as much energy, uh, for, for the day, if I haven't got some, some, uh, exercise in, in the morning. Um, the thing though, that I think if you ask people, what am I known for? Uh, and maybe this is being a, a New Yorker, but everybody tells me I'm a really fast walker. And when I'm, I'm out with my team going to go for lunch or grab a coffee, or you know, we were recently visiting some investors in, in New York and Boston, we were walking around the city. I, I found myself three or four strides ahead of everybody all the time. and have to remind myself to slow down. It's uh, so everybody teases me about that a little bit. Well, we are up to our final question. Uh, we want to look, have you look forward. Finally, we want you to look forward 12 months for us. And we're wondering what your priorities are as a CFO over that period. You know, as, as we've talked about, we're on file with the SEC. We're, we're a company that is, uh, you know, getting ready to uh, be a public company. And while we've made a lot of progress over the last couple of years uh, in the pursuit of that, um, we've come a long way. We still have more work to do. So one part of the sort of my job for the next 12 months will be making sure that we're buttoned down and ready, going through all that kind of public company readiness work um, in, in, across the organization so that we're, we're ready for, uh, for that moment when the opportunity arises. Um, so that'll be, that'll be part of my focus. And then the other part is, is sort of broader and less really just about the CFO role, but, you know, we've grown a lot in the last few years. We've, we have, as I said, it was, you know, maybe $150 million business when I joined and last year it was 750. And we're still, we're still growing. We've added a lot of people. Uh, we've, we're in five countries now. Um, we want to make sure that we as a company maintain the kind of small company ethos as we get big. So we talk a lot as a management team and as an organization about staying small while we grow big, staying connected to our values, staying uh, hungry, staying you know focused on building the best possible host and guest experience to drive this marketplace um, to be, you know, as big and as successful as we think it can be. We're very, very much in the early days of pursuing this opportunity. Um, we think that the future is very bright and we will be successful if we stay small as we grow big as a company. So thinking about that kind of as a background or the backdrop to all of the ways that we think about decisions and culture and um, our motivation as a team is going to be something that, you know, as a leader, I'm going to be trying to instill throughout the organization to help us be successful. And, uh, and I think the future looks really bright. We're excited about where we're going. Chuck Fisher, thank you for joining us on CFO Thought Leader. Thanks very much for having me. Appreciate the conversation, Jack. Hello, Thought Leader listeners. As you have perhaps already heard or even seen, we're now featuring the career lessons and moments of strategic insight shared by our CFO guests as thought leader videos. You can now find these videos on our blog at cfothoughtleader.com and of course our newsletters, but also on LinkedIn. 
If you haven't already, please go ahead and follow our CFO Thought Leader LinkedIn company page. And you'll be certain not to miss a single Thought Leader video debut. CFO Thought Leader, the number one thought leadership platform exclusively for and by CFOs. As always, thank you for listening.